Hey everybody, Brian Zimmerman here, executive editor of Jazz Is Magazine and host of Jazz Is Live. Welcome to another episode of Miles Monday. Yes, it is Monday. It is September 21st. I believe it is the last day of summer 2020. So uh, it'll be nice to kind of put summer behind us. Uh, that's one thing to celebrate today. Another thing to celebrate, of course, is, you know, the man, the myth, the legend, Miles Davis. This is something we do every Monday uh, with Miles Monday. And I do that, of course, with my loyal co-host, Vince Wilburn Jr. That would be drummer and nephew of Miles Davis, Vince Wilburn Jr. He'll be joining me on the show today, as will today's very special guest, trumpeter Charles Tolliver. Um, trumpeter is an, uh, Ch Charles is an incredible trumpeter. He's a band leader, composer, and arranger who just released actually a new album called Connect. It is his first album in nearly a decade. Uh, Charles is just really a beautiful player. He got his start playing with Jackie McLean. Uh, he's played with Andrew Hill, Oliver Nelson, Max Roach, so many more. Plus, you know, he's played with Herbie Hancock, Lenny White, and Ron Car Carter, and a bunch of other musicians who have played with our man of the hour, Miles Davis. He is here to talk about his amazing career and tell us a little bit more about this new album. So without further ado, let's go ahead and bring in Mr. Charles Tolliver and my co-host, Vince Wilburn Jr. Hey, guys, you there? CT! Hey, hey. Hey, what's up, Vince? What's welcome. up, CT? What's up, B? Welcome, welcome. Vince, hey, thanks for joining me for another Miles Monday. Charles, really appreciate you being here, man. Thank you so much. Yeah. The new album is beautiful. I'm looking forward to talking about that. I'm looking forward to getting into your amazing career. I want to let people watching know, though, we have spoken to you before, so we have some extra charles tolliver content online for our august uh 2020 digital issue got a wine raging conversation there you can subscribe to read that um you can also subscribe to become a reader of our fall 2020 issue check this out guys this is our latest print issue it's all about the art of the album we get into some miles davis stuff in here for sure miles of course really helped kind of pioneer the concept album in jazz so this is what is available right now subscribers are getting it at this very moment and new subscribers can read it in its digital form on our website but yeah charles vince thanks so much for being here good to be here how have things been for you? Uh, you're in New York. We were talking a little bit about this, uh, you know, before we got on air. You're in Yonkers, yes? Uh, yeah, Riverdale, like. That's right. That's right. How how has life in lockdown been for you, man? Oh, man. Uh, running up and down the stairs with my little buggy. <laughs> Hey, anything to stay active, anything to stay active. You release this album, though, which we have. Yeah, okay. Keep, uh, keep, keep you yeah. know, good exercise. You know? Keep it moving. You have gifted us with some beautiful music to listen to. Again, the new album is called Connect. So I kind of want to get into something because there's an interesting uh, uh, chain of debuts. I want to walk it back to the beginning of your career. There's an interesting chain of debuts here because your debut, your recording debut, was with Jackie McLean, yes? Right. And Jackie McLean's debut, you can correct me if I'm wrong on this, Vince. Jackie McLean's recording debut was on Dig with Miles Davis. So they say. So they <laughs> say. Yeah. <laughs> so it's a cool <laughs> chain of events. So they say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Ch Charles, tell me about what it was like to meet Jackie McLean and make your recording debut with a jazz legend? Well, I mean, uh, for a kid uh, who ate and slept J-Mac and Donald Byrd, all those records, and, you know, Lee Morgan, and the record that you mentioned uh, with Dig, it was like... Um, a dream come true. I guess it's the only thing that you can say. You know? Yeah. How did it happen? You were playing, you were in New York. Um, you were in New York and somebody came and kind of scouted you, right? Well, you know, they used to have jam sessions at a place called the Blue Car and Net in Brooklyn. Okay. And one night I was, I was there and uh, Jack Dijonette, who had just arrived into New York at the same time, 
uh, was there and Chikoria, and you know, just everybody playing, you know, uh, jamming that night. And when I came off the bandstand, uh, there was this gentleman sitting at the bar named Jim Harrison, who is still alive. And uh, he said, you know, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm the president of the Jackie McLean fan club. I have a fan club for Jackie McLean. And uh, wow, fan club. <laughs> yeah. Never heard that one before. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and he said, you know, yeah. I guess he was listening to me uh, wailing away up there. And he said, you know, Jackie might be looking for a new trumpet player. And uh, he told me where to go see Jackie. I did. And about maybe six months later, um, I went to a place where he was playing at and I reminded him, I, you know, I come to see him and he said, okay, come to my house. Now I haven't, I haven't played for, with him yet. So he said, come to my house and uh, he says, you have any tunes? So I said, yeah, I have some tunes. Uh, he says, okay, uh, I'm gonna put you on this record date. So when I tell people that, they say, well, you know, you gotta be kidding. You know? So Wait wait a minute, see, 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 wait, wait, wait. <laughs> he, he hadn't heard you play yet? And he said, I'm gonna put you on the record date. He, had, he probably had heard. I, I mean, he, of course. He, I, I mean, when he you was had going, ears he was everywhere. Going on the word, he was going, yeah, he was yeah. going on, on the, you know. Word, word on, on the street. Harrison's words, you know. That was, yeah, that yeah, was yeah, his yeah. man. Yeah, but, I mean, yeah. I took my trumpet out at, at his house and and played the, played the tunes. And that was good enough for him. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, because half the tunes on that record um, were from you. And you know, we should mention this is the record we're talking about. It's yeah. time. This is an iconic record, has all those exclamation points on it. Half of those were were your tunes. So he was obviously kind of smitten right. by your writing chops, you know, as much as your trumpet chops. Well, look, man, I mean, I've said this many times. You wouldn't be talking to me right now if it hadn't been for Jackie McLean. He mm. he was everything. And that's yeah. and that's what a young, you know, um, player needs is someone that just takes them and mentor them and um, see that uh, perhaps they have something, you know, to contribute, you know? Absolutely. Yeah. And, and really for Jackie, he continued that role of mentor, you know, till the end of his life, you know, was starting the school up in Connecticut. I mean, that was, and he just taught so much just from being on the bandstand with Jackie. I've heard stories from the trombone player, Steve Davis, about playing in Jackie's group and learning lessons the hard way. Everything from, you know, how to play bop over 300 beats per minute to how to dress, you know, for a gig. So that's, that's what Jackie passed on. What was he but playing? I, I have to say, yeah, I have to say that, you know, I had done my homework by the time I met Jackie. I mean, you know, since my teenage years, you know, you're talking about Miles Davis, I mean, yeah, you know, the record that really, I guess, after listening to Max Rose and Clifford Brown, you know, my uncle, he had all these hip records and I, we all lived in the same apartment building, you know, um, and my folks upstairs and him on the ground floor. And I'd go down there every day and Miles had just released uh, Around Midnight, you know, his mm. first, you know, with Columbia. And um, I mean, that's still with me today, you know? Yeah. yeah, yeah. So let's go there because I'm a trumpet player too. And so, you know, I'm curious as to who you were listening to you know, to kind of develop a style. Um, and, you know, since Miles is the man of an hour, I'm curious to ask you again, you know, through a trumpet player's ears, when you first encountered Miles, you know, what were you hearing him doing that was so game changing, that was so groundbreaking, that was so different? Well, the first uh, listenings of Miles was uh, in 1949. Right. Concert in Paris, and uh. 
at first, it was almost like it was dizzy because, you know, Vince, I don't know if he's ever told you or, you know, like, you know, he said, you know, like, well, I can play that way too. <laughs> you know, yeah, you know yeah. popping all good. those high notes. Yeah, popping yeah. all those high notes. Yeah. And, um, and then I, you know, I went to work on, because I mean, as a, as a, as a toddler, uh, you know, my first years were at five years old, listening to jazz at Philharmonic, you know, Charlie Schaefer's Little Jazz, you know, Dizzy, and then uh, graduating on up uh, to the Charlie Parker records with Miles Davis as well. And the thing that always stuck out for me about Miles was his choice of notes. Mm. Yeah, yeah. And that Just how tone, sparing, how economic. Yeah. Yeah, but I mean, he could play fast if he wanted to, and oh, yeah. he did. And when he, when he, you know, whatever the situation called for it in his brain. Uh, yeah. But it also his sound. Right. You know, right. So pure. Recognizable at all times. You know, and uh, so that stuck with me that. You know, if you're going to handle this, this um, the most difficult of all instruments. You know, and you say that you know, like violinists say, no, no, my, you know, violin is more difficult. There is no other instrument more difficult and unforgiving than the trumpet. So true. As as a trumpet player, I can absolutely vouch for that. And on the same hand, I feel it's the instrument. That's the most transparent in terms of personality. You know, you could, there's a whole de range of tones you can get on this trumpet, um, you know, just based on your own embouchure and, you know, aperture. It's, personality comes through on a trumpet like almost no other instrument. And that's why it was the ideal instrument for someone like Miles Davis, because you could hear that tone was like him talking, was like him singing. Um, and yeah, just just the choice because, like you're saying, a lot of people thought when comparing him to Dizzy Gillespie, especially in those early recordings, that he couldn't play as fast and that he couldn't play as high. But you listen to some of the later stuff; he was up there in the stratosphere, hitting high F sharps and G's and A's. And of course, you well, know he, he could rip he with the best of them. Right. Yeah, he didn't need right. to. Right. He didn't need to. He didn't need to. Right. I mean, I mean. You have people who are specialized in that, and that's what they do, and they do it all the time. You right. know, there's sometimes it's called for the play up there, and sometimes not. You know, you have to know when to choose. You know, um, and uh, Miles was, you know, the epitome of choice of uh, delivery. You know. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Who else yeah. was filling your eardrums at the time? Maybe not even trouble players or not even jazz musicians, but what else were you listening to that was kind of contributing well, to? Well, Charlie Parker. Here's a, okay. Charlie Parker. Yeah. Charlie Parker. I mean, the Godfather. You know, yes. I mean, he well, invented the language. Well, because yeah. you know, of, of the way, well, yeah, and, and the way he swung the eighth notes. You know, this, you know, this art form is about how you swing the, the eighth notes. Right. If you don't swing right. them, in the right way it's not it's not that you're not playing well with whatever it is you're doing but it's not this art form so to speak right. i mean you know this is this is you know you gotta swing the eighth notes yeah. and that's not something that can be written you know there's no exact notation for that feeling of swing um that's innate charles you learned because you you grew up in jacksonville you were self-taught on the trumpet right yeah, you know, like my my uh, beloved grandmother Ruthie. She, um, I mean, um, Leela. My mom was Ruthie, and my grandmother uh, Leela. I guess she saw that uh, you know I had this interest in music, uh, and uh, I was about eight years old, and you know I'd have been asking her to get me this trumpet that I saw uh, in uh, this little dingy little uh, pawn shop in Jacksonville, Florida, mm -hmm. with a with a with some sheet music of Dizzy Gillespie hanging over it, you know? And uh, she managed to scrape her pennies together and she got that for me. 
And uh, I guess I just was made to play the darn thing, you know. <laughs> Put it to put it to my lips and uh, boom, you know everything came out without any air problems, you know. And uh, <laughs> there was this one uh, gentleman, the only one in Jacksonville at that time that you could go to. Um, and I wanted to, I wanted him to show me what to do with those three valves. And he told me the notes involved with those three those three valves, you know the um, diatonic scale from C. And uh, you know, I was off to the races. My whole time was spent messing with <laughs> with those three valves, you know? And, uh, That's beautiful, man. You, know. you went uh, to Howard University, and from what I hear, what from Vince was telling me, you were studying pharmacy? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, the sort of story about pharmacy was that in in my in my uh, senior year in high school, I was working uh, at a little drugstore in Harlem, and I think probably was the only African American uh, pharmacy uh, in Harlem at that time. Uh, luckily, it was just right up the corner from where I was living on 137th Street uh, and Seventh Avenue. And um, you know, as I waited to, for them to give me some medicine to take to the neighborhood folks. I watched them mixing the medicine with the mortar and, and pestle, right? And mm -hmm. uh, this 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 got my attention because I realized that if they mixed it wrong, the people I was taking the medicine to might die. Yeah. So I mean, you know, those were real apothecarians. It, you know, it wasn't pushing a button now and the carousel rolls around, you take the already bottled medicine, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and that piqued my interest. And, uh, uh, you know, so uh, I applied, you know, at, to uh, Howard University's College of Pharmacy, which is a really famous, you know, still is, you know, everything about Howard is famous. And, um, I got accepted, and um, but I have to say that most of my time was spent in the fine arts building. Yeah, shit. <laughs> you know, yeah, uh, uh, yeah, man. And um, you know, uh, I met Andrew White. He was a he was a freshman with me, and uh, okay, uh, you know, those are the, the it was a hell of a time, you know. And so, but in my uh, junior year you know i had been practicing in rock creek park you know and uh it just hit me you know oh i i got I, I gotta go with i gotta go with this now before i forget it you know <laughs> wow you know? and uh you know i just packed up came home and uh and hit the jam sessions you know wow man well, that led to Jackie, and we can go back to playing that first record with Jackie because Herbie Hancock was on that record too. I mean, oh you man, know, that president record, of the <laughs> that's, that record is still it's still about my my most favorite recording uh, because um, when you are thrust into that kind of danger, <laughs> yeah. good danger, you know, like like yeah. like, uh, like uh, uh, our daily. The, departed uh john lewis you know good trouble you know right. oh man and to be surrounded by absolutely iconic people in 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 the uh case of herbie and and roy haynes and and cecil McBee, that was his first record day too wow. right wow. right we, you know that was where we met you know when we became life lifelong buddies and uh but herbie and, and uh roy haynes which is i think the only commercially issued uh studio recording of, you know of With them of too the yeah of them. And, yeah uh uh it's magnificent there's no other words that you can say about it you know was herbie playing with miles he may have been just he starting was. to no, yeah no, no. yeah he was in the fourth year with miles and okay wow just about ready to break out you know wow uh, and and Wayne had had joined the band. Yeah. And um, um, 
So everybody, you were experiencing. Everybody, everybody, everybody was in New York at that time. Everybody. Yeah, you were experiencing that Herbie magic just as Miles was too. As a trumpet player, what is it like to play with somebody like Herbie, who it seems like anywhere you go, he's got you. You know, well, he's, he, antis he, he anticipates, right? You know, by uh, whatever the leading tones are that are coming off of your your horn, and he'll 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 pop, you know, something in there. You know, but it's not just accompaniment; it's the notes in the chord. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. What was it like with Roy? Like McCoy, uh, like, like McCoy Tyner. Yeah. You know. ACT. So with Roy, what was that? What was that like? Oh man. You know, <laughs> the marriage, the marriage of uh, you know, like Baby Dog, Chick Webb, you know, into Kenny Clark and Max Roach and um Phil Joe Jones. But Roy Haynes was right there, don't forget at the beginning of that. And yeah. for him to be able to play that forward, I mean, because, you know, Elvin Jones came right in, you know, uh, as well, uh, and then Tony, but Roy Haynes encapsulated everything. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. he can play inside, outside, as only he can. I don't know yeah, Uncle Marge, Uncle Marge used to that. call him slick. He said, he's too slick, he's slick. <laughs> <laughs> Slick. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. He had a he had a nickname for me, man. He called me Charles Stufa. <laughs> yeah, you know, a mixture a mixture of Charles and Tolliver. You know, Charles Stufa. Oh, uh, Charles Stufa. Yeah, wow, yeah wow. I mean, Roy, Roy Haynes. I can't say more uh, enough about him. You know, um, his own individual uh, tuned sound on the drums, the bass drum, and Tom Toms and the snare that that. And when he hits the snare, you know, at a certain point, you know, where, you know, when everything is going on, it's like magic. So snap, crackle, and snap, crackle, and pop. There you, <laughs> there you are. It was that snare. Drummers, they become like you can identify them with certain drums. Jimmy Cobb and the ride, you know, it was Roy Haynes and that snare, man. And it was, yeah, he'll be beginning of it, the middle of it, the now of it. Roy's a legend. Um, you recorded your own album, Charles, um, as a leader, commercially available album as a leader. End of the 60s, 1968, right? Was Paper Man? Right, right. Uh, even though it wasn't released. And until, I, had to have, I had to have Herbie on it. I, I had was going to gonna say, I was going to say. To add, you know, that the, is thing, an, the thing is, is that at the same time as, as Jackie took me on his wing and because I was playing around, you know, with him, um, Roy Haynes wanted to put a band because I was in Roy Haynes' first band, hmm. you know, um, in that same period. Um, and, um, you know, we were playing my tunes. And so in, in, in 1968, uh, you know, I decided, you know, I wasn't going to wait for a leader date. So I uh, found a studio over in Englewood, New Jersey. And um, I asked Herbie and Ron and Joe Chambers, who had been my roommate in D.C. Mm. All, almost the whole time I was there, Joe and I were together. And it was obvious that was the obvious choice for that rhythm section. Yeah, no, it is. It is a smoking album. Um, by the way, we're getting some comments on Facebook. And yeah, if you're watching, you want to ask a question to Char uh, Charles, to Vince, uh, feel free to drop us a line in the comment section. Yoli CC wants to know, Roy Haynes collaborated with Pat Metheny. And Yoli, I believe you are correct. Um, they put out a trio album with um, Dave Holland. I know you guys might know, but yeah, Roy Haynes did play with Pat Metheny. Absolutely. Good, good call, Yoli. Um yeah, that album, and it came at such an interesting time, Charles, because like we said, you recorded it in 1968. So we're really kind of at the dawn of what will later be called fusion. Um, you know, and this, I was just wondering what it was like to record an album when the winds are kind of changing like this, because I think we're it kind of in a similar time now. You're seeing a lot of fusion crossover with hip hop, with R and B, and straight ahead jazz. Um, it's always interesting to see how it adapts to the time. Um, I think this album, again, with Herbie, with you know 
Gary Bards, Ron Carter. I mean, we're talking straight ahead icons. Um, you really put out a very unique statement here. So what was it like to record at that time where it was, you know, In a Silent Way was about to drop, Bitches Brew was about to drop. Things were about to change. Right. Well, I wanted to, you know, have uh, an offering of what I was doing the, those past four years, you know, uh, mm -hmm. uh, since I broke in. And um, I wanted those particular tunes um, to see the light of day. Mm -hmm. And some of them I still play today, you know. And um, I just couldn't think of any better rhythm section to have, you know, at that time. Yeah. And uh, they were, they were, they just said to me, where is it? I said, <laughs> you know, I'm going to do this. Where is it? Yeah. Hey, CT. You know, the rest is history on that one. You know. when, Yo. when you, when you have compositions and, 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 and you compose, do you think about the rhythm section, you know, before the date and who the personnel that you want on the date, you know, after, you know what I no, mean? I like, think about the call? drums. I, 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 uh, I think about the drums first. That's what Miles used to say. I was going to say, yeah. Miles Miles. yeah. Drums, yeah. drums is first. All wow. the rhythm that I'm hearing, uh, you know, against the, you know, the melody. Sometimes the melody will come first and I'll put the chord changes to it. And sometimes the, you know, the chord changes will come first and I'll put a melody to it. But, but, I have to know how I want the drums to sound in there. So the drums is first, you mm. know, and then I'll mate, I'll mate the rest of that, you know, with, with uh, the drums, you know. But so when be, you're, you know, uh, straight ahead or you know, multi rhythmical things. And wow. Stuff like that. So when you when you're putting a date together. You think I want this sound on the drums? I'm I'm leaning toward this cat. I want you know, Joe in the studio. I want Roy in the studio. Wow. Lead with the rhythm first. That's important. Uh, Charles, when did you launch the label? When did because we should mention you know, Strata East. The label, that is your label. Okay. Okay. So so let me say this about the label. The label was a serious hobby. Ah. Okay, it was a hobby. Oh. It was not. It was not um, a nine to five or that. Uh, oh, I'm gonna create some. You know, it's gonna be like Motown or something. <laughs> it was. A, it was. It was a hobby, but it was a, a dead serious hobby. Full stop. And. Uh, you know, things started to roll off of that because of that attitude. Had it been, you know, just, well, oh, let me see if I can do one or something. And uh, uh, I intended it to be only for me and Stanley to put out our own records. Hmm. But it took, it, it, you know, since everybody was practically still in New York at that time, you know, guys started paying attention to it and, uh, you know, as it was being played on the radio. And um, so we were able to uh, take it further, you know, that way. Yeah. 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 As it expanded, did you find that it was right. difficult to, to balance with the playing? I mean, because running a label, you know, I know people that do it now is not easy. <laughs> okay, man. Again, this is a serious hobby. It was like, okay, coming off the road and, uh, Hey man, let's go play some basketball. You dig? We go out on the court and and you know. And we used <laughs> to do that actually. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I remember, you know, like Freddie Hubbard, Roy Brooks, you know, the guys who were athletic and could move. We, we used to go on the weekends, man, in Harlem, where the um uh, the famous club used to be. Um what's it what's it hey, what's that what's that famous club? Or Minton's? Minton's? No. Oh. During during Duke Ellington's time. A cotton Club? No, the other one. Savoy? Savoy. So, you know, the Savoy was on Lennox Avenue. And there was a playground. Actually, that playground is still there. And, you know, like, you, you know, 
we're like regular guys, man. You know. <laughs> So on the weekend, we go and play basketball, you know, pick up basketball. <laughs> yeah. And that's where you just, that's where the contracts so, take place. Yeah. So it, this was like a community of, uh, of musicians, more or less just like that, you know, with a, you know, a referee, you know, to say, you know, foul, you know, go to the, <laughs> go to the foul line. Go, you know. go to the free throw. Make a free yeah, throw. Yeah, you the free throw, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it was, you know, it was done in an orderly fashion. And, um, you know, for like almost 10 years, you know, that, you know, that way. And um, I think, you know, it got to be about 60 LPs, you know. Yeah, yes. And, and some, which of course became, you know, sort of iconic things. And uh, the next decades, um, I, I just didn't want to come off the road and go into the office anymore. And I figured, well, sixty—that's enough. You know, that ought to that ought to be a good good run to that. You know, and um, I just I, I shut down the the office. But I, I shut down the running of the operation. You know, mm. it just ran on its own. Which you know, people don't understand. Once a record company has them, I mean, the, the regular industry companies, uh, all they have to do is to keep the records in the record bins. Mm -hmm. That's all. all right. Right. And so yeah, there's plenty enough one stops to have done that in in the, in the era of the of the LP uh, time, which is now coming back. It is back actually, and yep. um, uh, I think around the late eighties, um, you know, just as um, the uh, digital CD format was, you know, up and running, you know, I um, retooled everything with the digital format so that you know the ones that I that I liked, you know out of that whole bunch, you know, to um, reissue them on, on CD. So there would be an LP and CDs for them. And um, that's, that's the story. You hey, know, CT. It was just, yeah. I got a question. Um, uh, two questions. Um, were, were labels, were the big, big labels trying to call you and buy you out? That's one question. And the second question is, how did the Gil Scott Heron um, uh, uh, that catalog, that yeah. I knew that question. I knew that question. Was coming. <laughs> <laughs> okay, to answer the first question, uh, maybe once or twice, but I had no intentions of, of um, selling, you know, uh -huh. this blood, sweat, and tears. You know? Sure, sure. Yeah. Not tears, yeah. blood and sweat. Mm -hmm. And, uh, mm -hmm. <clears throat> you know, one day because of the all the, you know, the noise, the good noise that was going on about it, um, one day um, this poet walked into the office and said, you know, I want to put out something with you guys, which became known as Winter in America. With all with all of those um, iconic tracks on it, mm -hmm. uh, and um, that gave us an opportunity because that really took off really big to uh, demonstrate that even a small operation like this uh, could handle you know that kind of a demand you know mm -hmm. and and so. Um, that's 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 the short story of a very long story. <laughs> you know, yeah, cause, good, cause I'm, good story, good story. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. I got I gotta say, I've I've been blessed to 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 I call him C T affectionately. But I asked you first if I could call you C T. But <laughs> but we have a thing called Lily's Loft on Friday nights, Brian. And man. The knowledge and the and the and with with Mr. Tolliver or CT, what they share with Buster and CT and Ron Carter and Lenny and right CT, it's like it's amazing, yeah. man. Then yeah, we that's... then we have young young. Go ahead, CT. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, young 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 um, artists on there that um, 
uh, Lenny has invited. And, you know, during this pandemic thing, um, since it looks like this, you know, there's going to be a moratorium for, for, for a minute, <laughs> you know, that minute is going to stretch into 2021. It's nice that uh, there's something on a Friday night, you know. It's interesting that, that Lenny picked a Friday night, you know. We, yeah. Uh, and um, uh, a lot of uh, knowledge and um, looking at, you know, where the music came from, where it's going, and uh, questions and, and answers uh, from the the generation now with us and, and Vinny and uh, Ron. And not everybody is on, uh, you know, of us on, you know, like every Friday, but most Fridays. And it's uh, something to look forward to, you know, to to have this um, interaction, you know, with the, the younger generation today. Yeah. Very cool. You start yeah. your week with the Miles Monday. You wrap it up with uh, yeah. Lenny White Friday. That's a Lenny, good week. Yeah. Lenny's yeah. Loft. Lenny's it, Loft. It's it's um it's um some of Charles some of CT students are in, in involved. Okay. Some guys yeah. who play with Wallace. You know, it's pretty right. interesting. Very it gets, nice. Yeah. You know, it's. It's deep. It's deep. It's deep. Very nice. Speaking of Lenny and Buster, both are on the new album. Again, Connect just came out. Um, let's start here. You know, this first album in 10 years. What made you want to get out there and put something to wax again? Well, I I didn't ask for it. it you know, it was <laughs> like, I mean, I could put out, you know, a recording anytime I yeah. wanted to. But I was sitting back, you know, for those years uh because i was sort of um uh, codifying a lot of um, um live things that have been done on tours over the years mm. and sort of you know you know seeing how i wanted to started to to issue those and which i'm still doing that you know so um i was on a tour uh, in which i was fortunate enough to have uh buster and lenny and uh, a young terror on the piano, Donald Brown's son. And he, I know Donald Brown must be just as happy as he can be because Keith Brown is wow. one of our shining young uh, stars on the, on the piano. And um, because it was a, a, a celebration sort of year, you know, with the 1968 recording, of um, right, oh right, of, uh, all stars, you know, paper man, yep. paper man. you know. Mm -hmm. um, I I decided that I wanted to have uh, Jesse Davis, you know, because he's a sleeper, mm. he bad, yeah. way bad, <laughs> and uh, um, it was it was it was perfect marriage, and uh, so the agent uh, for that tour uh, put the um, owner of uh, Gearbox Records, which is a wonderful, you know, new um, entry into this business. And um, uh, when we came through London to play at uh, the Jazz Cafe, uh, we put this record down. You know? So wow. that's so that's how it happened. Yeah, it must have been like one what one day in the studio, one two days, and one take, one take. Right on, man. It has a great feel. This record has a great feel, good energy, you know. Yeah. It feels like a live record. And, um, yeah, London, that's a great scene over there, too. I'm sure you were probably taking it in as you were over there. Because Gearbox is based in – is they're based in London? Oh, yeah, they're in London. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. and, great uh, scene over there. Uh, the, 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 the pandemic was lurking. Oh, right so this moment. was right at the beginning. You didn't know which way it was going to go. First week, first week of, uh, uh, I mean, in November, it was there. I'm almost sure of it, you know. Oh, yeah. Uh, and um, it didn't take much longer, you know, for it to yeah. start to come through Heathrow right. and right. to JFK and LAX and Seattle International and so on, you know. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, release this thing pretty much during the heavy quarantines. And like I say, I encourage everyone out there to go pick up this album. It is excellent. Um, you know, again, it's called Connect. But what Charles, track do you like? What track do you like? Copacetic is a great track. <laughs> um, 
you know, it's got a great, it, it's, you got a hard Bob feel, but like I say, everything you do is so current. And when you get young cats in there, like Keith right. Brown mixing right. with a drummer, like Lenny white, right. you know, and Buster Williams, yeah. that's beautiful, man. Yeah. Um, my you know, favorite, I'm curious. My favorite on there is, um, well, all, all four of them. Uh, I like Emperor March. Yeah, Emperor March. I was just gonna say that. Yeah, <laughs> that's my jam, man. Yeah, because it's got it's got three different drum things going on. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 That's my cut. That's my cut. Yeah, the drummer cut. The blue yeah. Soul is good. though. it's all good. And what's interesting is you wrote these lyrics. I mean, there's it's not a vocal album, but you wrote lyrics in the liners, right? Which is again, I think, is so cool. You know, people are again looking for kind of this album experience of I just don't I don't want to listen to singles on Spotify all day. I want to have an album, and your album definitely does that because, like, it's, it's got there's these, a history. There's a history yeah. to uh, yeah. um, the reason why there are lyrics. So um, about let me see. Well, this must have been eighties, nineties. Uh, I did I, I I did a tour, and I wanted to have vocal, because I had been thinking about that for some time, and so I put Leon Thomas, a uh, wonderful pianist, um, who who just passed away, who was a pianist with uh, with Farrell for all those years, uh, Bill Henderson. You know, came on, they call him, and uh, Benny Maupin, who was my playing mate when, uh, in McCoy's band, and Stafford James. Ooh. And um, those lyrics, all of those were mostly were written during that time. Leon sang those songs. And so um, I put them on this album because they were written you know, four, you know, three of the songs on there. And um, had I had, had a vocalist uh, on tour back in November, they would have been singing them. You know? ah, okay. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. The new album, again, you can listen to it now. Charles, what might, you know, because you're on the, you were on the road right up until these, we started locking down. What might live jazz look like? in the next few months or, you know, what do you see beyond this? Well, right now, um, the guys and uh, the establishments have tried to take the bull by the horn and do mm -hmm. the streaming thing. And that works fine as long as there's um, a good engineering, a, a, a good sound system, you know, to get the, the instruments sounding uh, like a serious production. And even if it isn't, at least there's the, the, they're trying to get the music out to the fans. And uh, I think that's a, it's a good idea as long as everybody is careful, you know, with the distancing and masks and everything. Uh, on the real side, obviously, until the scientists get just the right mitigating uh, uh, drug, uh, and they, they, they're going to get that. They actually have a couple as you know, the ones that we've been hearing about, which is okay if they catch you before you have to be ventilated. So um, uh, the, vac the vaccine, uh, you can get the vaccine, but it's about getting vaccinated. You know, right. you can have the vaccine, but what about getting <laughs> vaccinated? Yeah. It's until they get, they get enough millions vaccinated. Uh, no matter when they come with the, vac the, the vaccine itself, um, I don't see uh, you know uh, you know the governments of the world um, you know uh, letting it go back to the normalcy that it will eventually get back to. So everybody's going to have to hold on and and figure out a way to negotiate uh, their livelihood. You know. Uh, during this period, you know, um, not everyone obviously uh, uh, are the Rolling Stones, right? Where they, you you can see yourself through uh, even two years, you know, that won't work for most um, practicing uh, professional musicians because um, you know a good portion of them live from gig to gig, 
you know, right. the old adage of from paycheck to paycheck. Uh, but uh, the spirit is there to to uh, present the music, you know, to the fans right. and the audience right. that love this music. And um, right. uh, no one is just really sitting back and saying and wringing their hands, you know. Uh, and after complaining about it, you know, in, in, in the in the privacy of your your, <laughs> your own <laughs> thing, exactly. walls, you know, right? Get you know, you know, get to work and, and to get uh, to work, find, keep making music. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, hey, we are certainly glad you have continued to make music. Like I said, Connect is out right now. Now is the time to buy the album. It is excellent. Uh, Mr. Charles Tolliver, I want to thank you again for coming on the show. It has been a pleasure chatting with you and celebrating um, all things Miles Davis. Really appreciate it. Hey, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, let's do it again. Absolutely. CT, CT, you know how much I love you, man. You know? I love you too, man. I mean, I didn't, I didn't even know anything about that Miles had you. As one of part of his family, you know, uh, so you know, got to thank Lenny for that too. You know? yeah, so, yeah, 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 yeah. That's right. Yeah. The six degrees yeah. of Miles Davis. Yeah, yeah. I'm, hey, I'm still learning. Uh, hey, 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 B, well, I, we gonna I, play I, together. You know, oh, no, you and I, 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 I are gonna play yeah, together. Yeah, yeah. You know I said, yeah. I said, CT a track, man. He's like, yeah, man. We are gonna get into it. We are gonna get it. There you, you know, go. Yeah. I, I said, love oh, to see man. that. Charles Tolliver and the Miles Electric Band. Man, I, I'd like to say one hip. thing. I would like to say one thing about your uncle. Mm. So for me, Miles Davis was just about the greatest band leader because he knew how to put the right musicians together to accomplish, you know, what he wanted to do at a particular point in his career, you know. Mm. Um, and uh, I love the fact that whenever he wanted to pop a high note, he never missed. Hey, that's, that's right. And we can end on you know, that. It's like, it's like, I was going to say, man. Yeah, we, you know, it's like. How can we you follow know, that up? You know, yeah. when, you know, the right moment to go high. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 You know, he knew but, we had it. But you need to have the right drummer also. <laughs> oh, that's yeah. right there oh, with yeah. you. Mm -hmm. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. right. Mm-hmm. Very cool. Well, yeah. H how can we not end on that? Charles, thank you so much for joining us today. This has been awesome. Um, we're going to sign off with you. We'll see you backstage. Um, but Vince and I are going to wrap up with people watching at home. So thank you. Thank you again, Charles. Love Appreciate you, CT. It. Love you. Love, love you. Love you, too, you, man. All right. All right. Talk in, to you soon. In, all right. In a minute. In a minute. So long. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Vince. Wow, man. Charles man. Tolliver. Beautiful cat. Um, hey, B, all I could do is listen, man. I, you know, totally. that's, how, that's how it is on the Zoom because when he and Buster and Lenny and then Ron oh, comes man. on. Stories. Oh, we've Stories. had Mike Clark. Oh, man. Yeah. Oh, man. And we're just getting, Yoli wants to know a question. When was the last time Charles played with Max Roach? Yeah, we could have talked. I mean, Charles played with everybody, so we'll He's, have to have him he, yeah, back gotta have on him the show. Back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. we got to yeah. have him back on the show. What's coming up for us, though, Vince, next week, uh, we have got a Trumpet Summit, September 28th. So that is an anniversary of uh, of – Miles Davis is passing. Yes. Um, we're going to have a trumpet summit with Keon Harold, Jeremy Pelt, Etienne Charles, Sean Jones, Nick Payton may stop by. It is going to be the trumpet summit. Yeah. Again, some yeah. younger cats to celebrate Miles Davis's legacy. Uh, other guests we got coming up. M. Tume is going to be on the show. We yeah. got a really interesting uh, guest at the end of October. We're going to have the Potash Twins, who are jazz musicians, who have a cooking show. We're going to be talking Miles Davis, a little food. Don't forget about bit, Carlos. Carlos is coming. Carlos is okay, getting him back on yeah, to yeah. talk Miles. Uh, if you want to check out this Miles Davis gear, this Miles Davis swag we've got going, head on over to the Miles Davis shop. And like I said, check out our fall 2020 issue, all about the art of the album. We definitely talk some Miles Davis in there as well. Uh, sign up for our subscription on our website. You can unlock the digital version of all these articles. Vince. Hey, B. Another Always one. a pleasure talking with you, man. Another, Another one, dunk. man. Oh, yeah. oh my God! Yeah. I, I get <laughs> yeah. excited, man. I get excited because because, like I say, I'm 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 a student still. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. And that's why I'm so quiet, and I'm like listening and taking it all in. And these because, stories, they're you know, 
it's a better education you can get out of any textbook, you know, just yeah, yeah, listen yeah, to these yeah, stories. Yeah, yeah. Um, and the music, you know, Connect is a beautiful yeah. album. So thank you. Thank you, B. Thanks, Jeff. Thank you for hooking this up, Vince. Yeah. We re really appreciate it, man. Yeah. Uh, if you like this content, follow us on Facebook, subscribe on YouTube, hit that notification bell so you know whenever we're going live. Vince, another great Miles Monday. Peace I'll see you love. later, man. Okay, Be B. Safe. Stay safe, baby. Yep. So long, Bye. everybody. Bye. Bye.